Welcome, welcome everybody to Kill Your Darlings at Berlinale Talents. My name is Aleta von Fietinghoff. I'm the co-ordinator of the editing studio, which is the program for the first of field, uh, first field of work editors who have been selected for this year's Berlinale Talents. Um, and I'm very happy, I'm very happy, <laughs> sorry, I'm very happy to introduce you to Susan Corder. She is a longtime mentor of the Berlin Isle Talents Editing Studio. She has been around ever since the beginning. She's, award, she's an award-winning filmmaker, an editor, producer, director, and writer in the, independent, in the independent scene. She's also a story consultant and has been teaching all over the world, Africa, Europe, and America. And currently, she's lecturing at Columbia University in New York. She's a passionate talker, you'll find out, and uh, she believes in the gods of the editing room. Um, yesterday she said something that stuck with me. My God, my hand is shaking. This is like... <laughs> um, yesterday she said something that stuck with me. Editing is what makes a film. Historically, everything has already been there. Images, sound, music. But film was invented through the juxtaposition of those elements. And this is what editing does. Sometimes you have to delete some of those arranged elements. Sometimes you have to kill your darlings. And Susie says, since watching paint dry is about the only thing that is more exciting than watching someone edit, I like to talk about it. So welcome, Susan Korda. Hey. So I'd like to start out by actually asking people, how many of you here are editors or have edited? Oh, great. And how many of you who have done that like editing? Oh, good. You're getting it. Yeah, OK. How many of you do not like editing? <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for admitting that. How many people here are actually actors? Wonderful. Directors? Uh, director editors? Yeah. Producers? I like the producers over here. It's like, yeah, I'm going to just go up this high. <laughs> Sound designers. Love you. Cinematographers. Hate us, right? <laughs> <laughs> How many cinematographers or editors here? Cool. OK, so we're going to, uh, this is going to be fun because I don't only talk. I also show some clips. And we get to look at them and see, and, and kind of roll back what might be happening in the planning stage or in the shooting stage. Because you know, once you attack editing, you're attacking all of the crafts that go into making a film, from story to cinematography, acting. In fact, this lecture used to be called We'll Fix It in the Edit. And you can fix a lot in the edit, a hell of a lot. There are two things you can't really fix in the edit. Well, one thing particularly that you can't. You can change story a lot in the edit, but you can't fix casting. That is one thing. To date, I don't think you can fix in the edit. Um, so let me tell you about the name of this lecture, Kill Your Darlings and Where It Comes From. Well, first, right, how do you kill your darling? You have to be aware. You have to accept not only mistakes, but also intentions and all that. And then you can take on the action, right? Usually, when we become aware and we think it's a mistake, we go right to action instead of actually being in acceptance for a while. Uh, because the demons come out when, I, I like to say, we're, the demons come out when we're alone. When we're writing, when we're animating, and when we're editing. When you have more company around you, the demons are less likely to come and grab you by the proverbial nuts. Okay, so kill your darlings. Thank you. I'm going to the next, I'm moving a little fast. Kill your darlings is actually from Ian e. Foster. Um, from William Faulkner, who warned his writing students not to get attached to the beautiful turn of phrase, to be able to kill your darling, because we all, by the way, I forgot to ask about the writers here. How many writers? Cool, right? So all of you, I'm sure, have had this experience of writing, having that scene that totally moves you, and then the rest of the script are like little pillars holding up just that one scene because it's so precious to you. And you've been advised or you recognize that you had really a hard time going back into that scene that you love so much or that sequence that you love so much. 
So William Faulkner was basically saying, just get rid of it, because that attachment actually distracts you from the deeper work that's necessary. Now, Danny Boyles, I read, you know, and he's like the Scorsese of this generation, or maybe the previous generation. I'm losing track of generations. Anyway, his camera is extremely visceral, right? He doesn't really, he storyboards, he finds it in the edit, but what he also does is that he takes his favorite shot, it might be a $50,000 steady cam shot, and before he cuts, he dumps it. It's, you know, that's not killing your darlings as much as begging the editing room gods to allow the edit to go well, right? It's like, I'll sacrifice this, let me just have a good edit. But because he actually knows that that attachment is going to distract him. He loves this, and he's so visceral with his camera. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, it's an, it's an interesting perspective to take when you are sitting there and getting attached. How many of us get attached? Hello, right? <laughs> And then we wonder why we can't just make it better. Um, so one of the things that I find over the years is that people, when they're in the editing room, they go into this thing and they say, I'm showing this. Now, classically in writing, they say, don't tell, show. But when you get to the editing room, it's don't show experience. And it's really hard to change this perspective because we get, not only do the demons come out, but for some reason when people edit, enter the editing room, they get all rational. It's like, this doesn't make sense, or this follows this, or I have to be clear here. And all this cogitation, and they're, they're not like coming from their gut. And rules are fine, and your processes are all, your processes, everyone has a different process. Some people need to frame fuck for a hell of a long time before they can go deeper. That's okay, but just be aware that you're doing that, that that's what you need to do in order to get started. Some people get very organizational before they can go. Some people really like very tight timelines, and then they can get messy. Some people need to be messy, wild, and woolly. Some people need to start at the beginning. Some people need to start where, where they're feeling it. In fact, actually, I'll use this opportunity to, because um, I found some old notes here, and I'm really intrigued by something that um, Anne V. Coates, who was tapped by David Lean um, to cut, her first film that she cut was um, um, Lawrence of Arabia, and went on to do further Lean films and worked with any number of, and it was Academy crowned and all that. So she was asked about how she starts cutting. cutting. Um, first she said, I don't cut by rules. I always feel when I start on a film that I'm never going to get it. Suddenly, a magic comes to you. You find you've hit your stride. You find that little core you're looking for in that film. And then she says, be ruthless. Don't fiddle around with matching and such things, but go for the heart of the scene, for the drama, and always keep your mind on the telling of the story through pictures. But that's such a true thing. You can be in this business for decades, and every time you start a project, you just kind of shitting yourself, you know? It's like you're just feeling scared. And that's totally okay, that's part of it. Um, the only bad, it's like the only bad writing is not writing. The only bad editing is not editing. People heard me say that yesterday, so I apologize for those who've heard this before. By the way, anyone here for a second time? Uh, thank you. And, <laughs> and you're nuts. Okay, so what do we mean, you know, we don't show, we experience. I got to figure out what I mean by this, by looking at the card. Okay. So when you're, sh when you're showing, you're really talking down to your audience. You're putting yourself in this position that you know. When you're experiencing, you're in the same plane. And that's where your rhythms actually are, are more to the point. How many of you have cut and then you look back at it and it's just really tight? It's too tight and nobody's feeling anything. And you're like, but you know, I'm showing it because you're showing it. You have to experience it. I like to say to well, I couldn't say it in underground in America because I could get fired for that. You know, you don't say this to people below the age of 21. But the best way to edit is hungover without a headache. Because you're just coming from here. Because, you know, you gotta, you gotta kinda... I love this expression, when you get out of your way, you get it done. Who's the who that's getting out of whose way? You know, what is this creative, instinctual, understanding spirit 
that can actually do this work that doesn't need all that kind of thinking or second guessing. And that's when you know the demon is out there, when you're second guessing. It's different. Judgment, again, is also, when you're judging yourself, it's you're, judge, you're talking down to yourself. When you're discerning, discerning is neutral. Yes, there's a boom shadow there. Uh-huh. <clears throat> the line is not really spoken effectively, right? The judge is like, I'm going to kill that person. I, didn't, I can't do this. Why? The film's ruined. I, I, you know, I, I say that in the editing room. People have creative autism. Everything comes into the same valence. You know, it's like you, you don't know how to find that one, and this is more directors than editors, right? Editors have to hold this insanity and go, yeah, it's okay. No, don't worry. As I said yesterday, get a dog. You know, dogs are really the secret weapon in Hollywood, supposedly, in the, in the editing rooms. So showing something to an audience inherently is talking down to them. It corners you into rational thinking and affects your rhythms. So like a child, we play. And before I go to the next card, I'm just like, OK. I'm so full of joy, I am so full of joy, I am so full of joy. And you are pink. Yes, I'm pink, and I'm elegant. And I don't want to talk to you. But I want to talk to you, but I don't want to talk to you, but I want to talk to you, but I don't want to talk. Anyway, I do that long enough, and you basically see somebody yellow who's full of joy, and like a kid, like a child, right? This is what we're doing with the images. The moment we are actually judging them, we can't see the magic that's part of them. Oh, and something that finally occurred to me, a new thought this year, because I had these Columbia students that were thinking they're fucking, sorry, I curse a lot, they're edits. They're thinking they're edits. You can't think an edit. God gave you digital to make the edit. And it's very simple. Pink next to green is a different pink than next to blue, right? And you don't see it until you put it together. So there's no reason not to do the edit. Even if you don't know where you're going, like me. Um, so, like a child, that's a dog, Rebbe Nachis, may he rest in peace. He died, and my cousin's kid did this. He played, that's how he dealt with his mourning. He loved that dog, good dog. Um, and also, one of the things I really do find, more than picture, <sighs> I find that that film is more musical than anything else in all its elements and its composition and how it flows and what is happening in the screen and what's happening to the audience. So I ask you, does a composer show his composition or does he give it to you to experience it? Editing is like com composing. So here are some misconceptions. We're going to get to a clip of Bonnie and Clyde real soon, but I just want to set the groundwork. So this is what I find to be misconceptions. Continuity is of primary importance. Match cutting is essential to making a film work. Story always needs to be clear and motivations understandable and logical. Who agrees with those or has found themselves agreeing with that? Thank you for you. That's why you're here a second time, huh? <laughs> You didn't get it the first time? No. I mean, we get caught in that stuff. We just do. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's part of... And, and, and the person who really kind of knocked it out of the, you know, into our awareness, I would say, is Walter Murch. So who has read Walter Murch? Excellent. So you'll know this, right? The six points to cut for. Now, I give you this, or he gave you this, and I could like to refer to him as Dr. Dr. Professor Dr. Professor Murch. Um, because when this, this creative autism in the editing room, and it's your own film, and it's, you're seeing catastrophe, or you're the editor for somebody who's seeing catastrophe, or you're a producer. The, that, the whole thing about showing actually comes from when I realized that what... what um, how deep this goes about showing and about seeing is that very often, sorry about this producers, but very often producers and others attack the edit by what they see, not what they feel. So they look for match cuts, they look for crossing the 180. Anyone here not know what the 180 is? Be honest, good. Um, or um, any number of visual things 
because, and I asked myself, why is this? I mean, I, I, I know an Academy Award winning producer who's amazing, I mean, not just for one film, and this was his focus in the editing room. Great story producer, but he, and, and I realized people feel insecure when they go in the editing room to give feedback and stuff like that because they really don't know what the fuck is going on. You cannot analyze it. And editors that I know, they don't know how they do it. And young editors, the first 10 years of a young editor's profession, they're at least working 12 to 16 hour days. And I asked myself why. Because they, not just because the producers, are you done yet, or director, but just because they don't know what, they don't have a cut, they, there's, it's, they, it, it's such a, like you're in a dream and it's happening and I, or you'll tell me afterwards what your experiences are individually. We have a Q&A mic over there and I'd love to hear. Back to this, so how many people, let me go over what the emotions are, what the, what the list is actually referring to. Right? If, unless, unless, like if you have a line of dialogue that's not, I see dead people, I think you, know, you can lose certain lines of dialogue that aren't working, right? So you're cutting for the emotional truth. Um, the difference between the two, um, Ian Foster uh, said that um, the difference between plot and story, plot is the queen is dead, the king is dead. Story is the queen is dead, the king died of a broken heart. So again, it's that emotional dip into events that are happening. Rhythm, energy in relation to story, but we, and we all have rhythm. I don't care if you can dance or not, we all have rhythm. Um, I trace, 180 degree and more, and I'm just going to, because I love the way he puts it. So it's not just crossing the line and, and, and the action that's happening, it's the concern with the location and movement of the audience's focus of interest within the frame. So right, you might have had that shot where you, let's say, I'm gonna use the pointer here. Oop, no, no, no. I'm gonna use the pointer. So you, you buried some, so, you know, you have a composition where something's buried down here in the corner. Well, our eyes, at least in the West, we cross the screen in a Z-like motion very quickly. So things that are hidden down here in these corners are not going to be as perceived as when they're up in the corners. Wow. Um, let me just get back. Thank you, Rebby. Uh, okay. Two-dimensional space is the a composition of turning three-dimensional reality into a two-dimensional two composition. And three-dimensional space is spatial continuity. How many people have, oop, damn it. Okay, he gave it 4%. How many people have cut for continuity? Excuse, right, thank you. Come on, raise your hand. Come. I mean, we all start out. I think it's a rite of passage that you spend like five hours in your, you know, when you're cutting the first time to get that, you know, that, okay, I'm here in wide shot and I'm going to reach for this and cut into the close up and I'm going to like find the right spatial relationship. That's cutting for physics. That is not cutting for continuity. That's not cutting for flow. In fact, if you analyze match cuts, you will find that they're either overlaps or ellipses. Um, I get a lot of nods here. So you guys are way ahead of me, right? We're going to have to get this moving. Um, so Merch gave us percentages. He did a tongue in cheek, but it's a good, and, and the, I, I, I'm just rolling back a little bit. The reason I'm giving you this or reminding you of this is that when we are in that editing room and it's vertiginous and we're just like, we have nothing to hold on to because we are so concerned with that boom shot or that light being off, mostly if we're directors editing our own work. I mean, that's really hard not to bring what happened on set into the editing room. And for those of you, I say, write a vent. I'd have all my students do that. 
and, and I have directors do that too. It's like everything that you hate about the film and the production, and there's never enough time, and God gave you bad weather, just write it, write it, spew it out on a couple pieces of paper, and keep it with you in the editing room. So when you're gabbing at and complaining to your editor or yourself, you can read it and realize, oh, I'm just hamster wheeling over here. Let's get to the fun part, right? Because that just drags you, you know, it's like, oh, I did it, fucked up. So 51% is emotion. Nothing trumps, I shouldn't use that word, emotion. Okay, 51, that's, what, that's very simple. It's like this thing you can hold on to. Okay, what am I emotionally feeling here? Doesn't matter what's ha you know, what the boom shot is, what the um, focus is. Um, I mean, again, your own processes, your own preferences, your aesthetic is not to be second to this, but this is just a tool to help you get through that morass. Um, so now I'm going to show the opening um, to Bonnie and Clyde. How many people have seen this film? Excellent. So don't have to, but it's the opening. Um, and I'm going to leave it at the, I'm going to start with the credits because I have a trick question. It probably is totally infantile for you guys, but it's anyway, I want you, uh, it's about the music. Why does the music come in when the music comes in? Um, and um, enjoy it. It's 11 minutes. Keep track if you can. You do not have to take notes, of course, but it's an interesting exercise as to when we st stop paying attention and get pulled into story. Um, and I'm very curious to hear uh, what you see uh, along the lines of mistakes that they had going. And I'll give you some backstory then. So that's basically the first act of Bonnie and Clyde. All right, let's start with questions that I have for you. <clears throat> you can shout it out. We don't have to throw that around. What are big mistakes in that film? Well, now let's start with the music. Why does the music start where, where it does? No one? Thank you. <laughs> it's true. It does. It sneaks in because it's a, it, it has a refrain to it. And so with music, right, if you repeat a, a chorus or refrain, it gets thinner. It doesn't actually hit. It loses. It kind of holds together, and then it kind of pulls away. And they wanted uh, that, that um, schnulzer, as I would say in German, you know, that... Uh, heartstring one to, to land just on her face um, when, the, when the movie begins. Um, continuity errors. Anyone? Mistakes. Where are we seeing mistakes? This is not a mistake I'm holding on to. It's just a nice shot. Come on. You saw stuff, didn't you? Yeah. When, when they're by the car. Yeah, when she's sort of drawn. Yeah, yeah. when she's by the car, when she starts getting drawn into it. Right. Nice, by the way, also, that's a nice... Uh, uh, he's reeling her in, and the camera is actually allowing that movement, right? She's walking towards at the end of that scene. Um, oh, I'll look at that. Anyone else? Yeah. Right. Yeah, clothing, yeah, so there's some costume stuff, yeah. Anyone else? Are you regretting that you came to this, le uh, this lecture right now? Because <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, I don't know, I don't care. Anyone else? I mean, uh, what about focus? It's DPs, come on, give me something. Out of focus. Out of focus. Uh, yeah. I don't know what, where that mouth... At the, beginning. At the very beginning? Well, I, actually, let's because there's so much there's so much richness. Let me give you a little bit of backstory, and we can go over small and big stuff. Okay, a little bit of backstory is that this was Warren Beatty's first time producing. This was a script that had a menage a trois in it. It was actually landed at Truffaut and Godard. He ended up doing it. Uh, the scriptwriters were first time scriptwriters. 
The only person of experience on the set was the cinematographer who quit at one point and then they asked him to come back in. The conceit, I mean, it's um, Arthur Penn is a great theater director. He had done two films before. Uh, Mickey, um, The Miracle Worker, which if you've never seen it, which is about the teacher of Helen Keller, it's an amazing piece, and uh, which he directed on Broadway, and then Mickey won, and he might have done a third one, but he, his conceit in this film was with Guffey, the DP, he really wanted these choreographed one-take scenes. Did you notice the jump cuts at the beginning, right? So, I, I mean, there's just little cute stuff um, as well as Ah, he told me not to do that. Um, I think. Okay. So just for the hell of it, let's look at. I, 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 just because I feel like it right now. This this. Uh, now this shot, what she's doing. Could you put down the sound, by the way? Right. Okay, and I'm gonna do that. Right. Now, this is what I love. This is movie magic. She's actually doing her lips like most women do in a mirror, but then she's turning to a mirror, and she doesn't have a mirror in her hand. So when people overthink their stuff, they don't realize, like, it doesn't matter, right? It's like you want this luscious lip woman, because what is this story, by the way? It's a love story. It's a love story, and people go off and do crime together, and they actually... Their hearts separate in a way, but they still stay together, and there's an amazing shootout at the end, which if you want to analyze that, that's beautiful too. But we're not going there with this. So I just want to point out certain things here. Then we have the jump cuts. What is her feeling? What is, what is Bonnie feeling? What's her emotion? Yeah. Bored, right? Not depressed, right? Depressed, she'd be lying on the bed with the haagen and not moving, right? Boredom is really, it's like... I can do, oh, fuck, what is it? Well, then there's, oh. all right. What is the sound? Sound guys, what are the sound that we're hearing? Let, let's put up the sound and play it a little while so we can listen to this, just because we want to also know how sound gets put into it then. Can we turn up the sound? Nineteen thirty one Texas. What is it? Think about it. Okay, here's another jump cut. So we've gone through three jump cuts. I'm gonna move ahead. This is classically and it becomes then this is a POV. Right? But we're seeing it not from her POV. So this is also this important kind of like turn because a lot of people have these rules, it's a POV, I have to motivate the POV. And sometimes you hold on a shot just to get the turn of the head so you justify the cut to the POV and the rhythm is fucked up, right? Remember what Walter Murch said, emotion's more important than the rhythm. I mean, yeah, and that the rhythm's more important than the continuity. So, and now there are a hundred different ways of cutting scenes, but in a way, if we saw Clyde when she went to the window for the first time, you might as well call this movie Bonnie and dot, 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 Clyde, right? Motivating everything from her doesn't allow, there's a narrative space that we play in that we really feel in the editing room more than anywhere else. You don't feel it on set because that's just another thing. Storyboards, if you're good, yeah, you might be going in there, but it, because it's a rhythm thing and it's a chemistry thing, Right? You, you, don't, you don't get it until you're really in the editing room. You want it on your palette, and you want to know that this is what a shot can do. So any rules you have in your head about any shot, or any decision you made what, in your head about what a shot means when you're in the editing room, I invite you to hold loosely, to be curious about that, and to see what it does, like pink next to green and pink next to blue. You know, just see, because else you're thinking yourself into a stagnation, right, into, into a, a set of like, it has to be this way, and it's much too fluid for that. Uh, Dee Dee Allen, by the way, I just want to say about this film, when Jack Warner was shown this film, it was an art house film, if it wasn't for Cannes, where it won, it would have like just died. Warren Beatty's first time out, out of focus, by the way, and Warren Beatty, Warren Beatty only warms up at take 83. He's notorious for this. And with Altman on McCabe and Mrs. Miller, 
which he also produced, he insisted upon shooting further scenes, and Altman went, fuck you, and left him with the camera and the cameraman, but without any film in the camera. But he shot all night, you know, because he warms up. You know, and that McCabe and Mrs. Miller is a beautiful film to look at just because they wrote a lot of dialogue after the fact. Because he was together with Julie Christie. Julie Christie is done at take five. She's done. He gets warmed up at 23. The film had to be post-written. So a lot of that, a lot of dialogue you'll see behind heads. That's how they saved that film. Um, and which is a beautiful, moody, Western classic, if you haven't seen it. It's a very heartbreaking kind of tale. Um, so, uh, sound people, or anybody, anything about the sound? Texas, 1931. Ooh. It's not a train. Train Dopplers, right? Ooh. Oil. Exactly. But it's an interesting thing, right? Because the loneliness of a train would have been an interesting sound, but it has too much, in a, I, for them it had too much longing. They needed to underscore the boredom. All right, so now this film, the, that, that whole movement of hers, you could have kept it as long as it was, but then you have, a, it's not only how a scene is working, but it's also how, how is it impacting on the following scene. I want to roll back. Jack Warner, when he saw this film, this is, quote, what he said. That is the worst piece of shit editing I've ever seen. <laughs> he wasn't used to it, right? I mean, you know, they did not do jump cuts back then. Um, and Dee Dee Allen went on to become a vice president of a development, as did Margaret Booth at MGM, who was like the secret weapon of Mayer, because she would greenlight scripts. The editors are not seen, but they are extremely powerful, and if you know, if you have any sense, please show your script to an editor before you start shooting and get feedback on that, and do not take it personally. By the way, editors are optimists. They might seem moody and passive-aggressive and smoke a lot and just kind of grumble at you, but they are really optimists. They really feel it can be done, so, you know, they, and they're there to service that vision. I, I know it doesn't look that way a lot of the time. Um, so, so what you have, oh, by the way, uh, all right, so here we have just the sexy part. So, you know, I like to say that good editing, good storytelling altogether, but really good editing is like good sex. You provoke an expectation in your audience they don't even know they have. Like, oh, my God, my, ew, that feels so good. And then you fulfill it. You do not, who, who can I, may, 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 may I touch you? <laughs> I, I won't be, how, 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 how can, it, so, okay, is it, and, and if, uh, it, you tell me if it's too hard or if it's too soft, you tell me how you like it, okay. That kind of editing is like, is this okay, did they get that? That's like, like having sex with Woody Allen, and I don't know how many of you want to have sex with Woody Allen, in my, in my imagination, right? So it's like, you don't want to start going and going, can I, ha, ha, are you getting it? Are you getting it? It's, it's okay, right? I can kiss you now? I won't, but I can kiss you. You know, it's like, no, you want somebody who like, just knows how to take you. So what she's doing here to a great extent, too, and one of the ways that, uh, and it just occurred to me after all these years, because it's not the overt motivation, I think it's totally instinctual, but Dee Dee Allen likes to actually step out to step you back in, right? When it gets interesting in a way, it's like, then she goes out to a wider shot, and we're like, want to go in. Which can happen, the chemistry also with, uh, with actors, Thelma and Louise. <sighs> Talk about casting. Thelma and Louise. Two really attractive babes, right? Having this story happening. Granted, you know, sometimes you think you're whiplash there, you know, with a Harvey Keitel character. But when Brad Pitt comes on the scene, everybody, everybody's like, can we just follow that guy a little bit? You know, then he's off, and then he's arrested, and then he's finally hauled away. And it's like, oh, really liked him. You know what I mean? And it's not a thought. It's just this, like, he just lands on you, right? That is chemistry. Um, and, you know, one needs to, in the cut, Jane Campion, the, 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 se the sex scene when, when Ruffalo is handcuffed to the radiator and Meg Ryan's having sex with him. There is no juice. 
Meg Ryan, girl next door, lovely, love you in Seattle and wherever else you want to be with Tom Hanks, but she's not sexy. Nicole Kidman was supposed to have that role, and she left and was just a producer on it. So if you look at that scene, it's all on Ruffalo. He's the heat, because that's what you go for. You go for where the, you, what, what's going to provoke us, what's going to land on us. And the editor is the every person audience, which has its whole, whole other bag of tricks and uh, necessary things. So I'm not going to go into this so much as like, so here we are. I'm just going to play this a little bit. Oh, we don't have, hey boy. Okay, so that's a shot. So she's stepping out. And it's like, the audience is like, is she naked? Right? Is she naked? And then what we have is. What you doing with my mama's car? Is she naked? You know, he's, he's like, wow, is she, ooh. Right? So that answers our question for us. And it's a cracked open scene, right? It's just we, we crack it open. We're staying with the flow. We're staying with the flow because if she was showing, she would, have, uh, she would have long been gone out of there. But because she's experiencing moment to moment. So one of the things that editors, which is good to do, which I think most of you do, is re talk the subtext to the screen. Talk the subtext. You will feel it. It comes naturally. We cut for subtext. We're in the emotion. Right? We're showing, right? It's a big shift to go from showing to experiencing. It's not all just like lovely instinct and okay, I'm, I am hungover, not without a headache, but it's not happening. You know, you, you, wanna, you talk it to the screen. That's, that comes in handy. That's a tool. So anyway, then we have this. Then we have the quickest interstitial dressing we've ever seen. Right? Um, and then look at these clunkers. And I just want to jump ahead a little bit. Look at those airline slippers that she has on now. Right? Okay? Just saying. Which I'll do, but just saying things that we only pick up on when we've seen it 45 times. Okay, so the other thing we have is if we had that long scene without the jump cuts in it, and then you have this one scene here. So they're talking, you take the dining room table. What about going? to town. I got enough money for Coca-Cola, and uh, since it don't look like you're going to invite me inside. Oh, you see the dining room table if I did. Oh, you want to go in town? How'd that be? I'm going to work anyway. You going to work, huh? Yeah. What kind of work you do? None of your business. I bet you're a movie star. <laughs> huh? A lady mechanic? <laughs> no. Maybe? What do you think I am? A waitress. Hold on that beat. This whole scene, by the way, is a minute tracking shot. So one of the things you'd have, I mean, this is not a European film, even though it has European influences, because the writers really wanted to do a Vogue film. Um, you have that long scene up in the bedroom with this scene, and you're beginning to drag your audience, right? But that's what they had at one point, right? Let's roll it back to the editing room. They're there with the rushes. They're there with the dailies, putting it together. This is not the first cut they came up with. This was the final cut they came up with. So they had to feel that in there. Um, by the way, how do we know she's a waitress? Yes? Yes? The response, what else? It was written. Who remembers that it was written? Who doesn't remember that it was written? Right? So we're going to jump then to the rules of perception. It comes from the stage. I, I have it on a card, but I'll give it to you now. First, first thing that you have is a foundation. The second time something comes up, it's a recognition. And the third time, it's an understanding. So for example, you open the stage, curtains open, and there is an office. And somebody walks in, passes a desk, and that's, so the foundation is that all the props are there. But when the person passes the desk, you see there's a gun on the desk. That's recognition. Then somebody comes in angrily. And because of the rule of theater, if there's a gun, it must go off. You know that the, you understand that this gun is going to be used, right? That's basically a short form of putting it. And they do this. I mean, this is a very 
finely crafted script. Um, and um, so just hold that thought. This was long, right? Like it was for one minute. Um, I mean, there's much here. Production design, right? She was caught before by the, by the bed frame. Now she's caught between these two hoses. You know, the, the, they're, they're doing their good thing. I love the way he gets his feelings get hurt here. Let's play this. So I know that you were, you're just, feel that? Like this is what you cannot do on set or anything. You, can, you, you gotta, you feel this, right? You feel that wide shot. All of a sudden it's like, right? That's what we do. We sit there and we feel these shots and we know where to put them then, right? She could have stayed there in this tension. You know, this is where they placed it. It's a beautiful, right? Everyone feeling it? Anyone have a clue what I'm talking about? No, because it's totally transmittable. Um, uh, DPs, want to say anything about that scene? Did you see anything? Where are the DPs? Yes. Right. So, yes, and also the lighting changed within that scene. Um, you know, all this stuff that if you really paid attention to, you'd, I mean, if you really put that as a priority to cut for you, wouldn't be cutting anything. Here's another jump cut, by the way. It's a little comedic. Let's see if you see it. Hey, what's your name anyhow? Clyde Barrett. Hi, I'm Bonnie Parker. Did you see it? Who didn't see it? The magic of filmmaking, this is great. You don't have to see it. I mean, the editors want to have quick eyes, but the idea is that we're actually working on the understanding that people only see so much. It's when he says his name. It's minor, but it accelerates, it accelerates the pace, and they have to get out of there. Clyde Barrett. Hi, I'm Bonnie Parker. I'm pleased to meet you. Okay, now I just want to go to... this. Change it. I don't like it. Mm. Really taking that moment there, right? Look. I love that hamburger. Oh, fuck. I'm um, sorry. Um, so, why does he do that? Shh. You got it? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to actually look at this stuff. So, so, this is a line that's really important. I I interesting to look at because they thought they had it and the director thought he had it but we're going to like um... okay that's the audience perception uh, let's just talk about the writing for a moment what they did was they split up a love scene into two scenes right very important if you want because sometimes when we're editing we have a scene where everything is happening in that scene and it's just too big too heavy too clunky can we intercut it in the writing phase for you writers, if it really is a big emotional turn, change location. It just, it alive, it just livens things up and, it, and, and you can go from, you have a beginning you can start from. You don't have to worry about everything you already covered. And on top of it, it forces you to find a different facet of what's going on. So in this case, Clyde, one of the reasons that Bonnie and Clyde were actually so good at robbing banks is that he was an amazing mechanic in real life, but he also was known for being prescient. He knew, he had an instinct of what was coming. And this is a scene that actually unpacks his ability here. And if you see the cutting, let's look at the cutting of it, because the only time we see her on camera saying something, opposed to not saying it, is when she corrects him. When he says, you put on your white uniform, and she goes, it's pink. Right? Well, look at that. That's a nice way of cutting it, right? Because it's the 
it's, and it's by the writing of it, the writing of it is that by the correction, we understand how right he is about everything, not just her looks. And then we have, so shall we look at it? You know, by the way, the shot before this was her coming towards the camera. So then you have the transition is them basically looking at each other. You know, just have fun, right? Play. Beautiful moment between them, right? So, by the way, 10 minutes in, he's telling her what we experienced with her at the very beginning of the film, right? He's putting into words what we saw. So, again, the script really does have some magic to it. She's a lot different than, oh, I guess I'm just going to town, right? She's like totally falling in love, and she's falling in love because she feels seen, right? Not because he's trying to make her into something, but then we have this beautiful thing. Now look at that. Now we have, now we have to, now, now imagine they're sitting in the editing room and they're thinking this is never gonna read, right? So how could they make it read? I mean, he did the right casting, look at this. Big eyes, big teeth, and he put gum in her mouth. I mean, talk about the perfect directorial camouflage of the spit curl. But nobody sees the spit curl. 7% maybe see the spit curl. And they're sitting there going, oh shit. So what if they could have intercut it, but then you might as well just put a, or held on it, changed the rhythm, crack the moment open, right? Make a moment between him and this waitress. Then you might as well just be putting like a neon sign just going spit curl, spit curl, right? You gotta just let it go and go, it's there. They could have cut it away. They could have just made it that he says to her, change that, I don't like it. Looking at her and change her there, I don't like it. What would have that been? This boring, yeah, probably, and also more questioning in a way could be. I don't know, I've never seen it without it. But he would have, how would it have affected the characters? It would have been making him a Svengali. Not so, he, she's falling in love with him because he is seeing her for how she wants to be seen. And that's, he doesn't want her to be, you know, this kind of waitress. Right? And that suits her. So sometimes you want to save something because it's not clear, but you might be cutting out some of the juicy, good, crispy, fat part of a, of, of a character connection. Right? And you have to... So that's why we always go back to the emotional. I don't know. She's a waitress from 1931. Um, so um, I think I have her... Yeah, that's her without the chewing gum. That's a still. And, and they did everything right, right? They, they camouflaged the, the, they put a, a, a card up, they, they, he addresses her being a waitress, she's knocked down by the fact that he actually can get that she's a waitress, he reads her and everything, he's changing her, no one sees the spit curl. Totally fine. Let me see. Oh, well, this is... So anyway, that's, I mean, it's just one of the ways of when you're like looking at scenes and you can start, I mean, it's very hard not to be going into the writing, into the acting, into obviously the cinematography, but had they cut away all those out of focus eye shots, you wouldn't have had this film here, right? He, he, he gets warmed up, they're losing light, they're grabbing the shots. Thank goodness he was the producer, because as a producer, he could say, just use it, just make it happen, right? And not get all rule oriented. So, um, any questions in the meantime, because I could hop into Jaws. I think you know the backstory of Jaws. Not one mechanical shark was not working, but two mechanical sharks were not working. Yes? Okay, the, the clipping. Uh, she's, uh, do, you, do you know the film, by the way? Do you know the film? Because she, she ends up taking photographs. And it, yeah, there is an off rhythm there, and it became very, I mean, I, I like, yeah. 
in the end, you're just as an as an editor, you are the all the every person audience, and it, somehow it has to come through that with obviously holding the vision of the director in the foreground of that. And it's a very intimate. I mean, most people, Scorsese, Bergman. I mean, I can you know go on. Um, somebody was saying um, the guy who did the favorite always works with the same editor. People, it's it's a very. I call it the editing womb. It's a very intimate place. It's a place where um, um, that can get really hairy because people can get really upset. Um, and somehow editors really like those kind of small dark spaces. I don't know why myself. Verna Fields cut this. Um, she was known as Mother Cutter when she cut this. So they had 21 days of shooting. 16 were rain. I'm making these numbers up. It was it was a lot of rain days, <laughs> and um, uh, they were writing it as it came as it was uh, being shot. Uh, one of the uh, line producers actually in an interview said that he had done an Ill illegal act because when the insurance company came to see whether they were on schedule, he lied and said everything was fine, which was illegal for him to do given contracts. So and. Um, uh, Richard Dreyfuss talks about seeing Spielberg on the plane uh, going back to L.A. where he left the B camera crew to do the end of the film, you know, the end of the film. Um, and, um, and he knew that Spielberg was having a nervous breakdown. Spielberg really did think it was the end of his career. And in the editing room, they came up with, you know, they couldn't show the shark. Talk about production fucking gods. They had two sharks. The gods killed both of them, basically, so that you have this real scary subliminal presence that they, that they achieve. But how? I mean, I'm going to jump in. Yes? Very much music, and we're going to look at that too. But you also have to, and it's interesting, because he, uh, Williams can only actually write the score to when it's cut. I knew somebody edited a documentary for Spielberg, and it was like, no, but I do the cut to music. Well, I only do the music to the cut. So um, this is the scene right after the dog and the kid get killed at the beach, you know, where you have that, that uh, the wipes onto, um, um, what's his name, Roy, Roy Schneider? Uh, the sheriff um, going in closer and closer um, while he's looking out there. So this is the scene afterwards I want to, uh, uh, and going into then um, a family scene. It's about nine minutes. You ready? create the sense of this ominous presence, right? This uh, mindless. So let's look at the editing and let's look at the, a little bit of the cinematography. I just want to show you something here in this scene. If we move through quickly, when we get introduced to the only person, look what that camera is doing, right? It is swimming in. This is what Spielberg likes to do, right? The camera is actually Spoiler alert, this is the only person that gets killed of the pe people we know. It's the introduction. It was the actor's choice to eat the cracker and show his teeth because it's kind of like a shark thing happening between him and the shark, right? He survived that shark attack in the Second World War. Even the, look, the, that lovely uh, extra bends forward. We have the, the picture of the shark on the blackboard because we need to have an ever-present sense of shark. Notice how there is a person in the jaws of the shark on the blackboard. So, I mean, that's production design. That's like, let's, we got to do something. Let's do something. We're creatives. Okay, now this is a scene. I'm going to do it, play it without the uh, sound on. It's something people, editors hate doing, returning down the sound. Now, he starts talking, right? He's just saying that he wants... It's going to be pleasant. I value my neck a lot more than 3,000 bucks. Chief. Turn off the sound, please. Right? So we've got these moving cameras. And then we got a still. 
How many editors really hate when they have to do that? Right? You're feeling it, it's knocking up against something. Well, they took out, and also, okay, now you can turn on the sound, by the way. Please. Find him for three, but I'll catch him and kill him for ten. And you're going to make up your minds. You want to stay alive and ante up? You want to play it cheap? You're on welfare the whole winter. I don't want no volunteers. I don't want no mates. There's too many cats. There was a line of dialogue there that they cut out. Right? He's answering the subtext. We just hung on the sheriff, and he's like saying, I don't want your help, because he said, then, you know, we'll help you or whatever. You know, there was this written out scene. But this is the really fun part that I didn't really see until. Look at, the, look at, so he's sitting there, right? Now look at the head of the, sh of the mayor. Look what happens. Basically, he, he leaves, and then they shoot this, but they didn't use it in that order. So. This is easy to get to. If I can, if it will go. Alex Kintner is the kid who was missing with the people. Damn thing. Thank you very much, Mr. Clint. He already left. We'll, uh, we'll see that? Take it under advisement. Mr. Mayor, Chief, ladies and gentlemen. So why are they doing that? I mean, the end of the scene is him going away and then maybe this close-up. Because they, he wanted, they wanted the proximity of these two main characters, right? They're affecting each other. The emotion is between this sheriff who realizes this guy might be something. It's not the goodbye to the mayor. You know, that's just a beat. We're stepping out. But the head is in the wrong position. But no one notices it. So we, we, this is the thing about not getting attached. It's a POV. So what? It will also work as other things. It's the end of the scene, the head's in the wrong. Do you really see it? No. Because when you come back then to the, to the shark, I, I keep on forgetting the actor's name. I love him, though. Um, he's like, you know, really, he, he has so much gravitas. He, he like anchors this transition moment. And the magic in film is the transitions. By the way, you know, what is ultimately, I mean, I always hated when I, when, when I was hearing in, in, in film school that drama is conflict. I hated that one. Why the fuck is drama conflict? Um, and then, you know, if you take it down and you take it in the editing room, actually, drama is, the, is, is contrast. Like, you can see this floor more because there's this carpet here. But if there was no carpet here, the floor would just get kind of like vague, right? So the tension is in the minute contrasts. And the, there's real energy in transitions. They're magical and you can go practically anywhere. I mean, when you're dreaming, you're not like really wondering how you got here. You get wherever you get. And the emotional line, the Walter Murch emotional line, is yourself, your psyche, that has many facets and much history, and I won't go any further into that. Um, so they, they want this moment to, to resonate. So that's the, that's the magic of, uh, um, of transitions. And I had another point, and it will come to me later. Um, so this scene, by the way, by the way, I love this, just for Spielberg, I mean, he, you know, the guy's afraid of water, and the whole thing is he's surrounded by water. See all that production design? And the costuming, he's never been good with females, and this is a good example, right? The woman gets dressed in the colors of water that he's afraid of. I guess he's afraid of his wife. Um, notice the lighting differences, and the Spielbergian little... Right. So they basically put it out of, out of order. What you see next, which is for us, um, the in-between when he's looking at the book, is for us. It was shot for his motivation, but it actually works better to keep the presence of the shark, right? And, and every scene that since the beginning, we have just seen sharks in one way or another, right? On the blackboard, now in the book, before the scene starts, again, when she looks at this, Right? And then we have the get out of there. Now we have 
This, by the way, was shot um, without sync sound, or if it had sync sound, they didn't use it. It's all post-written. So I just want to point to a little bit of writing here in, from the editing room, by the way, because when we're editors in the editing room, that's also when we start, actually, that's why I'm a story consultant and a script consultant. You know, it's like, what's that, the, the symbol of the, t the, the snake eating its tail? Ouroboros. That's what edited. I mean, it's kind of like you're there and you're so, you know, this would be written more or less. I mean, the editor has an idea. They're talking about it. This could be there. Spielberg does his thing. So let's talk about really inane and stupid dialogue, okay? Which I think Spielberg would not be unhappy with. Um, Tide's taking it right out. Can't we go home? Can't we go home? They just threw it there. They're there for the, the, the I mean, is he that much of a nutnik? I mean, really. But no, it works. It's like, can we go home? Okay, because it pays off later, right? Set up and conclude. Um, the pictures get progressively, we see the light of day here in his eyes. The pictures get progressively worse, right? And by the way, the music does not start on the following scene, the music starts. Can we go home? Right? We always want to sneak music in or never be like hammer on the nail kind of thing. And it gets worse and worse um, as they also do. So now we're going to take down a little bit of sound here. Um, can you turn off the sound? Because we're going to see, like, a truly... Because I do this because this is what they see in the editing room, right? This is all that craziness that happens when you're just seeing your stuff. So... Well, that looks a little... It has dynamism to it. This is a late response. Now they're... Okay, going out, going out. That's really threatening. Okay. Look at it. Two men go into the water. You don't see the one go out. The other one, when he looks, okay. So, and this is, by the way, you can turn up the sound just for a brief moment. So, yes, truly the music, but also the music is in tandem with the shark, right? It's when the shark turns around and is looking, I'm going to get you, you know, it's when, that, when the real driving force. And the rest of the shots, by the way, you know, always below the water line is the shark's POV. And they go there not as the shark's POV, but as the shark's emotional presence. I think the shark is pretty... F I think the sh in this scene, I think the shark is not just a mad person-eating machine. I think the shark has a sense of humor and has a fuck you. Like, I got your roast, and fuck you, scared the living shit out of you, and fuck you. Um, so he... he oh. Down with the music, please. Down with it. Let's, let's look at the further shots. I mean, this is like, this is what they shot. And they're looking at it, and it's like, oh, this is really threatening. Okay. Come on, come on. Now, this is a really threatening shot, right? Look at that. I, I mean, things moving through water is just not threatening, usually, unless you see it. So, and now we're going to see the eye line and, of course, the squeaky feet. But the, the water line keeps on rising. Um, when, uh, you know, when you're down there. It's down there now, it's coming up, right? And it's covering. And then, and then, great interstitial moment. Could you put up the sound? So trying to use dialogue that's post-written to just kind of hold this thing. It has its, I mean, Spielberg is also a little bit like from the Bard, right? That he has drama with comedy. He, 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 he likes that stuff, certainly in this one. So he holds it like that. Now, um... I have one rule. Are you ready for it? Are you, you going to take this home with you? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Wait. <laughs> How do you know if it works? Okay, let's talk about feedback screenings. Oh, living and not knowing. Yes, what we do, this is about reading subtext, editors. We're like actors. It is fascinating. We truly are like actors, because uh, actors, we know what's going to happen next, like the actor knows your dialogue, but we have to be in the moment as if we don't know what's happening next, to be in the emotional moment that motivates the next emotional moment. 
So I think I wrote that. Um, we exercise being a moment. I did. And it is magic. Okay. I ask myself these things too. Mostly, how many of you come from documentary or do documentary, since we're such hybrid people, right? So in documentary, we also often have a collection of scenes that seem to be saying the same thing over and over again. And we need to mold it. Um, this is, you know, there are variations on the theme if it's competition and stuff like that. But so in order to discern this stuff, you know, I, I, this is something I touch on too. Does it move the story for actually the reverse order? Does it develop the character? Does it move the story forward? Does it reflect the theme? Right? Theme is also one of those mercurial things, right? And if you keep on attacking theme, you'll see different facets of it. It's what, I don't know about you guys, but I always found like theme, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, feedback screenings. Okay. This is what I think God put me on this earth for, to tell you how to do a feedback screening. Um, the most important thing about a feedback screening, yeah, in New York, you know, nobody has time, so this is basic setup. But the most in, so that's, you got that? Feedback screenings. These are the, what, you want them? Okay, so now feedback screenings is different for distributors and producers and like. We're talking about feedback screenings, you know, because the director really thinks that yellow house there, which is not appropriate for this uh, 17th century America, I had this actually, is going to um, be noticed by the audience and it's not appropriate historical blah, 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 right? I mean, people do need to get insane about something. This is what he was getting insane about. Obviously, when you show the film, it's a wide shot. No one sees the yellow house. Those who do, like my brother loved to do that. My brother would tell me about all continuity editors. And I was like, really? I'm glad you like watching movies. You know, it's like, a, I mean, it's, you know, it's a sport. Um, so you got that? So the, there are four important questions. And the two bottom ones are the very, the most important. The longer the film, the harder it is, you know. But this is what I put out there. But the most important thing, do I have it written? Nope. The most important thing is that the director or the uh, editor who's ever conducting, the director is best to sit in the back of the room and just feel the room, feel the space. Uh, when when um, Some Like It Hot by Billy Wilder was shown for the first time to a test audience, a room of 600 people did not laugh. Can you imagine that? This is 1959. Was it Warner Brothers? The, the, the studio was just like, we can't do it, cross-dressing men, the ba ba ba, you know. Billy Wilder, thank goodness, he just knew it must have been a Kool-Aid in the water or the moon, something was happening. The next test screening, you know, it, it, it happened as, it, as it, he understood. He understood his laughter um, very, very well. But the most important thing is that the audience shouldn't ask questions of the director. They should actually make statements. Because the moment you're asked a question, you go from here into your head. Basically, in a very minor way, but it is an attack in that vulnerable space that you're in, showing this thing that is made out of kind of magic moments and spit and glue and passion and hope. And somebody's going, why did that person come out of the door? That really, ba ba ba, you know, it, and they could say, and then when you ask people to make statements, like, well, I can't make it as a statement. And it's like, try, right? And please try to do that for the first 10 to 20 minutes because the, it, it gets below the ego line. And on top of it, when then the director says, well, they come out of the room because I really, you know, feel that there's a threat there, then the whole room starts discussing whether it's a threat or not, right? And then it just becomes palaver. The director gets confused, the editor gets confused, the producer, what, what would the producer get? Tell me, producer. Like, I've wasted my money. Um, you know, and it just descends into something that's, that's not productive. And on top of it, it dilutes. So what you have is you have then a defended creative, and you have a diluted public, because they're hearing from the director what the director intended, and then just like Harvey Weinstein used to do with Miramax, when it was Miramax, was, as somebody said to me years ago, it's like they piss on it to make it theirs. Sorry, I mean, we've all given feedback where we're actually being the smarter person in the room or the one with saving the film or with the, with the more clear insights or whatever, or even really just helpful. 
But it's really important to honor those 10 to 20 minutes, because afterwards, people are going to be making their film on your material anyway. It's just the nature. It's inviting. It's the nature of the beast, and it's OK. But it's really it's, it's precious to allow the director and the creative team to really get a sense of how the film is landing. And then you can ask the questions. Did this disturb you? Did this confuse you? Did you like that character? Blah, 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 and all that. Um, I'll put up one last card after. How, how much time do we have? What time is it? Excellent. I hope you have questions. If not, we can just say goodbye. OK. I'm going to start back there. This is a mic. Did I forget anything? Gleb, did I forget anything? OK. Anyone? Oh! <gasps> Thank you. Yeah, so my question would be, at what time do you think the editor needs to be a part of the creative process, right? Um, I mean, do you already think that while writing uh, or, or developing a movie, we should already start thinking at it from within the language of editing? Or do you think that comes in later? Or at what point of time do you think we should start the, uh, well, I was once, I had a, I had a film where there was, um, there was a, 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 in the script, there was parallel scenes that didn't resolve. It's the weirdest thing. It just didn't resolve. And it worked on paper, but it, uh, you know, I mean, it's, and it's, I, I still have to examine other things, but it was one of, there, the parallel action, right? There's a sense of resolution. Resolution, either the people meet or it's, it needs, it just can't end. Right? It needs to have, because else it's kind of like a listing. And it was weird, because it's like nobody caught it un until it landed in the editing room. Oh, there you are. And, and um, that would have been helpful. He was a playwright that was coming from the stage. So I mean, we should all know our strengths and weaknesses. You know, I mean, I would definitely have my editor come in, because they're seeing with certain eyes, and they're feeling rhythms. You know, a lot of script supervisors become editors because they're the ones that time the scenes out, you know, in this very non-scientific way we make films, right? Does that answer your question? Um, I mean, to a certain extent, right? I mean, for me, what, what I was trying to um, ask, I guess, is how important is the creative key feedback of, of, of an editor? I mean, I've had, like, really terrible experiences with my editor in the past. And, um, Tell me more. I, what was terrible about it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know, me telling him how I want it done, him telling me back that, I mean, it was just interpersonal personal issues, I guess. I mean, we're both dicks at some level. Uh, so, uh, but, but more importantly, I, I mean, in going forward, I was also thinking maybe it makes sense to involve editors, uh, my, 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 my future editor, in, uh, on set. Like, well, uh, I mean, Walter Murch also warns against going on set, and uh, somebody else was mentioning it recently, uh, too. It's good not to go on set, because when you're on set, you schlep with you then everything you experienced that day. And you want to be the, you know, it is the magician's kitchen. And to know all the interpersonal or, you know, all the wonderful elements that the director is attached to or that you think is great can actually disturb. On the other hand, in do the right thing. Um, Spike Lee invited uh, during the, do the right thing when Mookie takes the garbage can and starts a riot at the end of the pizzeria. Uh, he shot it and shot it, and Barry Alexander Brown, who was the editor, was just not happening in the editing room. And so Spike said, "Barry, you come and you know." Yeah, he just also cut Klansman for him. But you know, you come and do that. And he directed the scene because Spike was in the scene, right? So, but that's all trust. So. I think the basic question there is, how does one build trust, right? So I think it's very important that you, like, how do you interview an editor? Like, I like to interview an editor by saying, OK, what thing in this film? By the way, never ask an editor for clips. That kind of defeats the point of editing, right? You ask them, you, you watch the films that they made, the full films, and I will ask, um, what, what thing did you really want to do that didn't get done? And, or what did you do here that the director didn't want? 
And then you hear about them, oh no, well, I love this, you know, I mean, I want somebody who is, for me, I mean, I, I, I want to hear the edginess. I, I, believe, I, I don't believe everything is harmonious, because I'm not. But it can be, and it's great. And if I can really, and you know, that's how I interview uh, somebody for that. But it's also, I can also say, look, this is what I like to do. I've had directors say, I don't want to see anything until you got a, a fine assembly. I'm um, just, don't, don't even call me and do whatever you want to do. Other directors, you know, they want to be there the whole time and then they breathe and you're like, what, did, what, what happened? Right? I mean, it gets kind of like, right. So you, and, and never do this to behind um, or next to unless there's trust. Never do this to the screen. There. <laughs> Cut there. Yeah, there. <laughs> don't snap. Don't sit in their chair. Don't put your hand on their mouse without asking permission. <laughs> if you're assisting and the editor walks in, get up out of the chair. It's their chair. You know, it's like, this is a little, am I right or am I right? All right, I see. Right? I've done all of that. Huh? Oh, there's somebody over there. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, uh, about this moment when you edit a movie for a long time and you cannot see anything anymore or you cannot see like what can you improve and uh, what do you think about having more than one editors? Well, I mean, that's a question of, uh, of um, it's a question of trust, it's a question of money, it's a question of time, which is also money. Um, um, if you're the editor, I mean, the editor, you know, there are certain tricks that one does. Uh, I mean, it's even as, as, this is to editors, right? I mean, you all know it, right? You put yourself back. You look at it at a different perspective. I had some, some people telling me they turn it into black and white if it's color and look at it, you know, on the screen. They, you change an element to see, everybody has their process. Get up, drink some water, you know, walk around, call a friend in to look at it. Uh, with you, or a couple of friends, just because the energy changes, right, in the room, the moment, and you're so, really, I mean, we're looking out of the backs of us, and I mean, we're, we're the, like actors, we're these full instruments, just there, and um, that is the, the million dollar question, because the quicker you can actually create tabula rasa, and be able to see it for the first time, the, you know, the more you can accomplish. Yeah. Um, and there's something, but there's a lot of frame fucking that happens. You know, scene fucking, frame fucking, right? It's sort of like how some people don't want to let go. Yeah. Um, and for director, then you just have to really see if, if, um, if it's not working. Because I happened accidentally to have three editors on one movie, and it was actually good for the movie. But I'm thinking about, like, how can I fake this process so I don't have to have three of them but it was, you know. Um, that, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. Um, and they all got along? They worked together or? No, it was. Uh, one after the other. Accidents, yeah, yeah. So I had to stop working with one and one after the other, yeah. And uh, all of them brought something really new and unique to the movie, so for the movie. So um, I, I don't think that movie would be the same with one editor. Well, I would love to, if you wrote something up about what you think that each editor brought, would be interesting. So Godfather was cut with three editors, but they actually each did one act, and Walter Mitch was one of them. I do not remember who the other two were. And you can actually feel it in the film. I think you can. There was somebody to the front. Woman had her hand up, gone. I'm oh, the one, it. yeah. Hi, um, well, do you think the editor should also, uh, sorry, the director should also be the editor because, I mean, I started as an editor and sometimes I feel that it's hard to let go and kind of, even how, even how much you trust the other person, you're like, but I have this vision, you know? How do you feel about that? Well, I think God gave us digital so that we can actually, you know, have a better, relationship with editors and directors. And so Merch talks about in the English patient, he was cutting on a Avid and Mengele was cutting on an Avid. And Mengele actually said that, you know, of course, Walter Merch's um, 
cut was, uh, was, was better. Um, and he also actually, they, uh, Miramax had signed off on it and they had a week more on the contract and he said, no, we need that week. And he went to Merch and he said, what crazy editing idea do you have that you haven't tried yet? And in The English Patient, if you remember, and now she's actually here and she probably didn't like it, but um, I want to say Isabel Hubert, what, who am I thinking of? Binoche. Um, after we come back from the final flashback where, uh, you know, uh, we know why he's burnt there, you know, he crashed the plane and everything, you see a shot of Binoche standing there crying at a low angle up in the, uh, the gallery. And uh, you see the overhead and then you see her reaction and she's crying. And, um, and then she gives up the ampoules of, uh, of morphine to kill him. That shot did not exist in that scene. They had the overhead and then they had her, but they didn't have a reaction. What they did have from what they like to call the beeline, right? Her relationship with the Sikh soldier was that there's a scene that they didn't use where it was low angle and he asks her for her hand in marriage and she's crying. That's why actors don't like this. She's crying out of being touched and, joy and I guess pleasure. Um, they took that shot, they rotoscoped out the, the Sikh and they put a neutral background on it and they smacked it in and they had her emotional response so that they could step into her action. Just a crazy idea, yeah, that he was being invited to, to give. So that's, and I, I went there just because it's a cool story, but it's also the trust and the understanding. And if, and Miguel needed something to do, right? So he's playing with it. It's definitely, there should be no reason that you on your laptop or your console cannot do some edits. Make sense? Yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's part of you, the way you're thinking, the way you're moving through the footage. Over here. Whoa! <laughs> I'm gonna put up something else. Yes. Hello. Hey, that's working. Um, yeah, I have a question about. Uh, is it supposed to be this way? I guess like yeah. that. Wait. Cool. Uh, I have a question about like using music in documentary. So sometimes I can't help but feel that by using, it's like too intentional. So if I use the music in a documentary, it's like, um, as you like said in the presentation, like talking down to the audience, like please pay attention on this bit, on yeah. that bit. So, and I still haven't worked out the rule for myself, or like where to use music in a documentary. Yeah, it's uh, wonderful. It's also, where do we use narrative techniques? I remember seeing a documentary of, the, of a maid and uh, she was with a, an elderly couple and the woman was in a wheelchair and there's a shot of the woman in the wheelchair that's being tracked, you know, in this documentary and it just took me out. It's a narrative device using it in a documentary. So it's like really fun stuff to think about and also how we're hybriding because, you know, there's so, uh, there's some easy stuff happening out there. Equipment's getting smaller and digital is going everywhere. So music is, um, I mean, the, the kind of rule, if you will, with music is not, music shouldn't be having us feel what is, what is there already. It, it needs to play off of what's there already. You know, whether it's like, if there's joy, you don't put joyous music, you put something that points to maybe foreshadowing a flaw that's gonna happen subtly, right? Or, um, um, or going more internal, when we realize that piece of music is not just kind of a narrative device, but it's really about that character's own thing. Like, I mean, it would be easy if you had a character who hummed to themselves, because then you would take that humming and you could work off of that, right? And you could fake that in a documentary, by the way. You can get away with that. I don't think it's unethical. Um, um, then there's instrumentation, right? Every voice. Every instrument has its own voice, so you can simplify like that. But it's worth exploring, and it's great that you're having a sense of it, and that, and that you feel that it flattens, if I understand correctly, it flattens the experience for you. Another way to start um, is just you know, get together with a good sound designer, call out to sound designers, because there's an um, environmental 
right? That can just totally open it, open it up. And you can also play with stuff. You can download anything you want, whether it's putting a ticking clock, you know, in a room that doesn't have a ticking clock, or um, airplanes going over. You know, things that that uh, you know. I'm just spinning over here. <clears throat> Sorry, I gotta. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, there are composers. I have a. I'll look at. I've actually a quote from David Mansfield. Uh, did you want to? Re no, no, not yet. I'm just going to uh, search it. Thank I had you. the question of how you got started editing your first movies and what was your path? Did you go to film school or how did you start? Yeah, I, w I went to film school to talk about mistakes. I went to film school and. Um, yeah, I didn't know shit of what I was doing. God, I took credit, editing credit on the film that I didn't even fucking cut. Um, I got, I was hired, I was actually on a film that was coming to Berlin. I'd never been to Berlin, my first assisting and only assisting job. And at the same time, I was doing lab work for this film for all mankind that was blowing up 16 millimeter footage that went into space. So they, on like a 30 meter daylight spool, they put like 50 meters on. That's how thin it was, and it had no key numbers. And they were blowing it up to 35, and I would just sit in the lab and I match a rough cut that they had going, or selects that they had going. And, um, and then I said I would do, I convinced the German film that, because I speak German, to bring me here, and then I got a call. This terrible thing happened. They had a Serbian in Houston. They had a, an editor who was from Serbia who had been in his VW bug, and in downtown Houston, an 18-wheeler truck had crossed the line, smashed into him, and killed the guy. So I got this call going like, okay, we want you to cut this film down here in Houston. And I was like, I can't do that. I promised that I was going to be assistant over in Berlin. And they were like, oh, I can't put you to your own. I was like, sorry. My boyfriend at the time, who was actually became co-producer on that film, he was one of the technical directors in charge of the blow-up which only could be done because the Challenger had exploded, forget about it, it doesn't matter. He called me up from Havana. The call cost something like $250 at the time, it was 1986. And he went, get, let me get this straight. You want to give a picture cut to be an assistant? Explain. And I was like, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so I had to tell the German. But it's like, if I, I mean, it was stupid luck and I was still too stupid to see the luck and somebody had to tell me, you're being stupid in a nice way, and then I, so I cut that film, and that was nominated for an Academy Award, and I had no clue what I was doing. What is your first editing experience? It was my first editing experience. <laughs> and I, I, I just said to somebody, you know, the mistake was, I was on the steam back, it was a 35 millimeter steam back, and the film is, at the time, was not even considered a documentary, because it was all this footage from NASA with no talking head, just voiceover and Brian, o, Brian Eno's music. And I had spent 10 days getting the sequence, you know, with the music and the voiceover and the image, and, and then it got out of sync. Got out of sync, and I was just like, I can feel it now. It's just like, you know, fell into my, my heart fell into my belly, and I looked at it, and it was better than what I had done the first instance of the editing room gods. And then there's another little story because I was on, you know, tape, so I'm doing tape, tape splices, and you know, you get air bubbles in there, so you know, you get, so I, I, did, a, I did a tape splice and there was like no bubble in there, and you know, just me being me, I was like, yeah, no bubble, right? Then the demon, I got up, right? And I'm just like doing a jig, which is good for the <laughs> heart. The demon came in and went, Susie, you're such a loser if you're celebrating like doing a fucking tape edit. You'll never get anywhere. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. And I sat down. Ten years later, I was like, fuck you! I'm going to do my jigs. So I invite you all to do your jigs. Whatever the fucking edit is that you like, celebrate it, celebrate yourself, and go back to work. <laughs> I think that's it, right? Thank you. I just want to give you one thing. This you should look at if you, uh, this is really good for not writing reams of paper, trying to get out uh, ideas. Uh, I've shortened this. Um, 
but it's um, Michael Rayberger uses it in developing story ideas and directing the documentary. I use it to refocus in documentary. It's great for themes, right, one at a time. And I'll just give you a little bit. You saw Rebbe Nach is a dog, right? In life, I use an aphorism. In life, I believe in unconditional love. So think of the images that come up. Just hold on to images and interview questions or whatever. In life, I believe in unconditional love. I will show this by making a film on Rebbe Nachis, the dog, and how he tries to save Susie from a broken heart. The main conflict will be between suicidal Susie and Rebbe Nachis, who not only does not know what biped love is, but doesn't have thumbs. Ultimately, I want my audience to feel what a loser Susie is, and understand that even losers deserve unconditional love, right? You just had a little film in your head, right? All in its own individual way, you know. I, I was thinking about having the dog in a little doggy self-help group, right? She doesn't feed me, she's lying there with the haagen -Dazs. Anyway, um, but I would go to the books, actually, because he's developed some further, and they're very good, and they're, and they're little, little gems, little facets, of theme, little facets of don't make long lists, just one, you know, keep it crisp. And, and things will, and it's only paper, right? And it's not reams of paper, it's not like three pages. Right when you're developing your ideas and you read your three pages and it's saying the same thing over and over and over again in just variations, and then you have to make it a proposal and put it in and you realize you're just skimming the surface, this helps you get deeper. Little things. Anyway, thank you very much. Hey guys.